That's good. Hare Krishna. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak a few words today. So, thank you. Did you normally, do we just start the class or do you start with Jai Radha? Jai Radha Ma Kunja Bihar Gopi Jana Balladha Giri Baradha Jaya Radha Mahava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Vallabha Giri Varadha Ya Shoda, Ya Shoda, Ya Uh, 
श्री राधा माधव की श्री श्री राधा श्याम सुंदर की श्री श्री कृष्ण बलराम की श्री प्रहलाद नरसिंह देव भगवान की श्री पंच तत्व की जगत गुरु श्रील प्रभुपाद की अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृक्ष की मिताय गौर प्रेमानंद हरे कृष्ण Thank you very much for joining today, and uh, is it a nice weather? It's a nice, uh, cozy weather also, and uh, it's a nice opportunity. It's always a nice opportunity to speak about the glories of the Supreme Lord, and we are often speaking about the glories of Krishna. But there is something that is more pleasing to Krishna than speaking of his own glories. that is speaking of the glories of his devotees when we speak of the glories of krishna's devotees then krishna becomes even more pleased just like if someone comes and says something nice about you you feel nice you say okay thank you very much they give you a compliment but then if they say something nice about your child then you become very very happy right then you feel extra happy and they suddenly become your favorites because they always say nice things about your children similarly if you want to become uh, close to krishna then we say something nice to krishna but if we want to become very close to him then we say something very nice about his devotees correct and that way we become a uh, part of his inner circle krishna begins to recognize us so today let's take that opportunity to enter the inner circle of krishna by glorifying one of his great 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 vaishnavas one great devotee of the lord So, how many of you have heard of uh, the Shad Goswamis, the six Goswamis? Have you heard of them before? Have you seen them before? If you see closely in this altar, we have the whole Guru Parampara is here, and towards the end, over here, we have the six Goswamis. Okay, so the next time you come close to the altar, you can come close and you can see the six Goswamis. It's my own speaking. so these are the six goswamis sorry let me just keep my phone on side i think we should take the opportunity to speak about all the goswamis one after the other whenever we have the opportunity but today we're going to start off with one goswami one very celebrated goswami of the six okay and his name is ragunath das goswami okay, so ragunath das goswami is a very very glorious vaishnava so we'll share a few thoughts about him though his glories are unlimited and continue to speak for a very long time and practically you know if i even today if we start speaking about him it's going to take many hours but if i continue to speak for many hours then you may not come next sunday so so i'm going not going to speak for many hours we're limited to one hour and during this one hour we'll try and speak as much as possible about ragunath das goswami okay so there are many details about about him but i'm going to limit it to a few details that i can share with all of you in fact his past times are so intense and so deep that sometimes i wonder if Uh, if we can even understand and fathom the, the limits uh, of his unlimited pastimes it's like that he is he is simply amazing and uh, you know just one mouth and few years may not be enough for us to completely accommodate everything that he has done and his entire glory but we'll we'll talk about a few things so ragunath das goswami was was born like any simple child to his parents and his parents were very um, celebrated um merchants or businessmen 
In fact, they were very rich. And they had this uh, business of collecting tax. So the king would collect tax and the king would send few people to collect tax on their behalf. So Raghunathas Goswami, when he was a small boy, his father and his uncle, they used to take up this role of collecting tax on behalf of the king. And the king those days, this was about 500 years ago, this was even before the British had invaded India. This was the time when the Mughals were ruling India at that particular point. So most of the places were ruled by the Mughals. And this was in Bengal. And uh, the whole of Bengal. And where Raghunath Das Goswami was born is now Bangladesh. Back then that was also part of India. But uh, now you know, after the partition it has become Bangladesh. So his birthplace is there in that particular part of the country. Now, Raghunath Das Goswami, he was born there. His father was doing this particular business. They were working for the king, the Nizam at that particular point. And they had this, they would collect tax from the local people and they would take a commission from it and a large commission. And in this way, while taking collecting commission, they would make a lot of money. Out. So this was their business. And they had a lot of money. They were extremely rich, extremely rich. And Raghunath Das Goswami was in that particular family, but he was not at all interested in that business. And he was not at all interested in any kind of wealth. From birth, he was a very simple child. And he was a born devotee. He was constantly thinking about Krishna. He, was, he only wanted to serve Krishna from his childhood. And this was a problem for his parents. Sometimes parents can become very worried if their children become devotees of Krishna. I have one such experience that um, in towards Maratha Haldi, there is one particular school. Many years ago, during our free time, we used to go and conduct programs in that particular school. And we used to, uh, the owner of that school was a Sindhi person and he was quite a um, very rich man, but he was also very you know, oriented towards Bhagavad Gita and all of that. So he used to call us and he used to tell, you know, whenever you have the time, please come and conduct classes. And I said, okay, so tell me what are the limitations? He said, no limitations, unlimited, whatever you want to do. So I said, I'm going to take it very seriously. He said, yes, take it very seriously. So we used to go and conduct classes for all the children there. Children were very naughty like any other children. And they continue to be naughty. But in all their naughtiness and everything, they became wonderful devotees in course of time. It was, I think, a span of about, not even a year, in about uh, six or seven months. They all became wonderful devotees and uh, the children wanted to chant. They wanted to perform kirtan. So much that the children would go back home and while sleeping in the night, we used to tell them that in the night, you know, uh, Shastras explained that when you are, when you want, if you want to sleep well, you have to remember the Lord. And the form of the Lord that we remember is Padmanabha. Padmanabha, Ranganatha, sleeping, right? So we remember Padmanabha, then you don't get any bad dreams and you sleep very peacefully. You can also do that. You can remember Padmanabha and then you can go to sleep. And uh, in the morning when you wake up, you can chant the other names of the Lord. You can say Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Or you can chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra, Govinda. You can recite the names of the Lord. So multiple times you can recite. So we had told this to the children. If you are traveling, you are beginning your journey, you can chant uh, Narsimha Deva's name. You know, Jai Narsimha Deva, or sing the Narsimha Dev's gift and you can do that. So we had told this to children. The children had picked it up and the children really loved it so much that even when they were bathing, they used to bathe Krishna, 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 Krishna. They used to bathe all the time. Many of the children in the night when they were sleeping, you know, you, they turned from one side to the other side. They would be out oh, and they would turn. Now the parents were observing this and they were like, well, what is going on? So much Krishna, Krishna is going on. And they came with that kind of complaint uh, to the school saying that the children, what is, what are you doing? What are you doing to our children? So the principal got worried. Principal asked, what, what happened to the children? No, uh, they got picked up some very bad habits. They said, what bad habits have they picked up? Uh, believe it or not, parents actually said this, bad habits. Oh, what are they doing? They said, all the time they're chanting Krishna's name. Even in the shower, they were ch chanting Krishna's name. Uh, and then uh, they wanted to call, 
can speak to you know this person who comes and so they called me so i went there and spoke to the parents i asked them okay what is the problem they said you know even when they are bathing you know my child and one mother is crying earlier my child used to sing some bollywood songs very nice songs you know i we all used to enjoy it now it is only krishna krishna you know so <laughs> i said really you are finding that to be such a problem they said yes i asked them is there any problem the, in terms of education are they studying less or something no they are studying very well but you know they they saying we are not going to watch tv uh, they are they are only going to you know study and when they are not studying they they are opening some book of krishna and they are reading this so I, i said okay but what is the problem with that how is that troubling you in any way they said no but it is not normal you know <laughs> so you see this is what happens that sometimes we get so used to abnormality that when uh, something becomes normal in our life then we become very uncomfortable that how is it so normal correct so if any changes in our lifestyle etc there some sudden changes then we start feeling that oh isn't this isn't this abnormal how is this happening right so the same thing that the parents went through the parents may go through even now uh, most of the parents go through it my parents also went through it when uh, when i was a child i i was introduced i didn't know i'm still uh, still a sadhaka but when i got introduced to krishna consciousness i was quite young i think i was i was about 14 or 15 or something like that and it was my mother who bought a bhagavad gita from uh, you know i i don't know if you know in indranagar there is a radharindra swami temple so in that temple there were some devotees some wonderful devotees like like all of you who were distributing some books and my mother picked up a bhagavad gita and she bought it and then i read that bhagavad gita i did not understand head or tail but i i just you know uh, fell in love with krishna at that point and i was just enjoying reading so much and the more i read the more i started understanding and all of that um, and <clears throat> thankfully because of that i never got into any bad habits or anything because at the right time i got bhagavad gita so there was no bad influence of friends but my parents also started getting worried uh, so i was asking what is your problem you know? because <laughs> all my friends when they reached college they started smoking and my mother was wondering No, but isn't that like I said? What you want me to smoke? What you want me to do? Right to prove that I'm a good son? What should I do? He said, No, but you know, all these they're like normal kids. No, they're all doing whatever. Uh, so I said, No, I'm not doing anything like that. I'm very happy with my life. I don't know why you are so worried. My parents were very worried, but they had a reason to worry also because uh, anyway, I'll I'll tell you something that uh, because later I joined the ashram and I became a brahmachari. But I believe that. it is important that every child at some point they should be part of a regiment be part become a, a brahmachari and all of that so i was a brahmachari for some time in the ashram then i stepped out stepped out i got married so now i'm living like a grihastha so <clears throat> this is actually the normal journey of life this is how it is supposed to be and because of my life as a brahmachari i, I you know many things come as very natural gifts that you know uh, today people when they do services also sometimes they wonder how can i do service for free am i going to get anything in return but when you serve as a devotee uh, then we just you stop expecting anything in return you simply only want to serve krishna so there are some wonderful things that pick up uh, as a brahmachari <laughs> anyway so the same thing happened to raghunath das swami that uh, his parents were worried about him. so one day <clears throat> we'll go with the slides there are some images for all of us to see so that we can connect this session is dedicated to shila prabhupad ah, yes so ragnar das goswami would spend his day and night simply reading shastra understanding more about krishna etc and in his meditation he would keep thinking of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu and he would keep thinking that when will i get this opportunity to meet chaitanya so chaitanya mahaprabhu it so happened that one day he comes to a place called shantipur shantipur is in a is in west bengal uh, in a wonderful beautiful place called mayapur anybody has been to mayapur here okay so if you haven't been then uh, our murli uh, priya prabhu will take you one day to mayapur so uh, mayapur is a wonderful place we should all go there it's a wonderful dham so close to mayapur there is another place where advaita acharya's home is there or panchatatva is there 
So in the Pancha Tattva, there is one Acharya with a white beard. So he is Advaita Acharya. So it's his house was there. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited her, his house. So when Raghunath Das Goswami got to know about it, it's many, many kilometers away, but he decided that I have to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He has come quite close. And those days there were no trains and nothing. So he had to run. He had to take a horse or he had to run. He did whatever he could. And finally he reached Shantipur. And he met Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then he started serving Chaitanya Mahaprabhu under the guidance of some other devotees. He didn't know how to serve. What should I know? So he was doing some menial work, cleaning this, cleaning that, cleaning the plates. And he started doing all that. And he had finally met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he was only looking at Mahaprabhu, his limbs, his beautiful limbs, and how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu looked. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, if you read Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, there is a description of how his body is. In fact, when we read the scriptures, if you read Ramayana, the, the beauty of Lord Ramachandra is explained there. If uh, our Srimad Bhagavatam explains the beauty of Krishna and how beautiful Krishna is and how, how his limbs were, how his body was. Similarly, Chaitanya Charitamrita explains the beauty of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and how beautiful he was. He was very tall. Uh, he had a broad chest, broad shoulders, and he was very good looking. In fact, he had very long arms and his arms are so long. It is said that in uh, how do you recognize a very, very great personality, spiritually great personality. They have many physical features. One of them, there are many. One of the physical features is their hands will be very long. In fact, their hands will be long enough to reach their knees. Okay, so long. Anybody here with your hands reaching your knees? Mine are reaching my knees right now. <laughs> but it becomes a little short when I stand up. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, like that. You know? So, there are some qualities like that. So, he was just observing the qualities of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he was so amazed. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's color of his skin was so different. He, uh, it, was, it had a golden hue. In fact, there is nothing in this world that can describe the features. Lord Ramachandra, generally Krishna or most of the forms of Krishna, he is dark in color. But his darkness is a different dark. It's the, not the darkness that we may be used to. His darkness is different. It's compared to the, a dark cloud. It's compared to certain flowers. So anything that we can relate to in this material world. But it's not exactly that color also. That's why he's called Shama Sundara. Right? So Megha Shama. He's also called Megha Shama. Because these are some things that we can kind of connect. So Mahaprabhu also had a golden tinge to his color. Ramachandra, he had a, he was dark. But his dark was different from Krishna's dark. His color had a tinge of green. So how a person can have green, we don't know. It's unexplainable. But Ramachandra was like, his bodily features also is explained in Ramayana. Of how his arms were like pillars. In fact, his arms are so powerful like pillars. It is said that he did not need a pillow in his 14 years. Because he would just sleep like that. Right? His arms are so muscular like that. Uh, when we... When they make movies out of Ramachandra, they don't, they can't depict someone so beautiful, right? Uh, if someone goes to the gym and look, they actually become very ugly with body bulging everywhere. Uh, they cannot become beautiful with extra muscles like that. But uh, Ramachandra, it was not unnatural muscles. His body structure itself was so beautiful. And Ramachandra, anybody knows how tall Ramachandra was? 14 feet. He was 14 feet, right? At that time, everybody was tall. Ramachandra was 14 feet. Uh, and as time progresses, people become smaller and smaller. Narsimha, I don't know. He's, he would reach the sky. Uh, those times were very different. Uh, Krishna, by the time Krishna came, people had become smaller and smaller. So Krishna's height was about 9 feet. Something like that. Right? So uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also was pretty tall. Uh, compared to the people of Kaliuga, he had appeared about 500 years ago. So he, he was also about 7 feet, something like that, 6 and a half, 7 feet. Uh, he was quite tall, taller than everybody else. So, um, Raghunath Das Goswami was simply amazed looking at him. And towards the end, 10 days, he served Mahaprabhu. And towards the end, he told Mahaprabhu, I don't want to go home. I simply want to be here and I want to serve you. Wherever you go, can you just take me as your assistant? 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I like your eagerness, but this is not the time. Go back home. So he said, I want you to go back home and be patient. So he said, okay, now Mahaprabhu is told, now what to do? So he went back to his house all the way back. And he went back, his parents saw, now his intensity of bhakti had become much more, in, so much more uncontrollable. He always wanted to be with Mahaprabhu. And every time he was, he was al always thinking, getting some information from somewhere, where is Mahaprabhu gone? Can I go here? Can I go there? Etc. Etc. He was doing all of these, um, all of these discussions and thoughts were going on in his mind. After some time, his parents saw saw that this is not right. In fact, he would not even enter his house. He would sit outside his house, and he would think that maybe if Mahaprabhu passes by this way, then I will be able to meet him. So his parents said, "No, this is not right." So his parents said, we need to tie him up. And we need to tie him up with some ropes. Invisible ropes. What are these invisible ropes in which you can tie up a person? Marriage. <laughs> so his parents said, let's get him married. So then they found a very nice girl, very, very good looking. And the description is she herself was like an apsara. So beautiful she was. So they got a girl like that. Particularly someone who is not very interested in spiritual life at all. Has to be very good looking, but has no interest in spiritual life. So they wanted her to get married to him so that, you know, he may eventually forget his spiritual life or something like that. And get lost in her beauty. So he got married by force. You know, he was a very young boy. In those days, you know, getting married also was at a very young age. So he got married as a young boy. Could not protest, though he requested that I am not interested in this. But, you know, he said, if you get me married, her life also is going to get spoiled because, you know, I'm not going to be interested in this marriage. So why do you want to put her in? No, 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 it's okay. And she was also very eager. Their family was very eager because these people were very, very rich. They had a lot of money. So anyway, they got married. And then he was very disinterested in that relationship. And time passed. Some time passed. Then he heard that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has again come to a certain place that was, he is on the way to Jagannath Puri. And he is again passing by a closer region to his house. So this time he said, uh, I have to go. And he used to try and escape, but his father had arranged for some guards. And all these guards would come and stop him. He couldn't leave his village. So somehow he escaped. He spoke to two of his guards. And told, I will pay you extra money. Don't worry. It's not only my father who is rich. I am also rich. I can also pay you money. I'll give you so much money that even my father will not give you. Right? I have a lot of money. So two guards agreed. And they went along with him and to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His, his thought was that maybe even these guards will become devotees looking at Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That was, but these people were not very interested. Because particularly his father had chosen um, guards from the Mughal um, you know, army. So they were all Muslims and they said, uh, you're not interested in all these. So uh, they stayed away. Anyway, so he went, he met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again, he served Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again. And then after serving Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he again said, can I just come and serve you? Can I just be your, your assistant, your servant, forever, wherever you go, I will simply follow you. Mahaprabhu this time very strictly told him, go back home. You're married? He said, yes. Go back home. Don't be a Markata Vairagi, he said. What is a Markata Vairagi? Markata means what in Sanskrit? Monkey, right? So monkey also looks like a Vairagi. Why does a monkey look like a Vairagi? Like a Vairagi, monkeys don't wear clothes. Monkeys eat only some berries, fruit, something. They don't have a pig's house. They roam around here and there. But are they actually yogis? They're not yogis. They are the most mischievous creatures. But they to look externally, they are like yogis. So Mahaprabhu said, don't be a Markata Vairagi. Don't just look like a yogi and don't be a You can be a yogi. Even if you are a married person, be a yogi. He said, go back home and lead your married life. So he became very heartbroken that how are these things even important? Because I've taken many lives, many births, billions of births. I've had many, many wives, many husbands, many children. 
many forms of bodies have taken. Then why is it important that I should do that? Why can't I leave and come and serve you? Mahaprabhu just said, go. So he came back home and he started living with his wife. Like a normal couple, they started living with each other. But externally, he was acting like he was attached to her. But internally, he was not at all attached. He was only thinking of Mahaprabhu 24-7. Okay. Now, he had become more and more desperate in his heart, but he was constantly thinking about the Supreme Lord. And one day, he heard that Chaitan Mahaprabhu had gone away quite far. But one day, he heard that in the same place in Shantipur, Nityananda Prabhu, the Lord in blue, blue color, standing next to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he is Nityananda Prabhu. Okay. There is one modern Nityananda also that you'll find on YouTube. We're not talking about him. Okay, this, <laughs> this is this is Bhagwan. So this Nityananda Prabhu. So this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu. This is the same Krishna and Balaram who appeared. So Krishna appeared as Sri Chaitanya and Balarama appeared as Nityananda Prabhu. So Nityananda Prabhu had the same spirit of Balaram, very strict, but at the same time, he was more merciful than Krishna. Balaram externally was more strict, but internally he was even more merciful than Krishna. If Krishna also ignores somebody, Balaram will not ignore them. Balaram would continue to bless them. Just like in Mahabharata, Krishna accepted the Pandavas and he rejected Duryodhana. Balarama kept Duryodhana closely. So, when you have nobody else, when Krishna also lets you go, Balaram will never let you stay. He is so kind. But externally, he is very strict. So, Nityananda Prabhu is like that. So, Nityananda Prabhu was there. He was there along with many devotees. So, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu telling um, Raghunath Das Goswami, advising him that he should go back home. The first time. Second time, again, he comes when he meets Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he begs him that you please give me an opportunity. Mahaprabhu sends him back. Now, the third time, when he hears that Nityananda Prabhu has come, he goes to meet Nityananda Prabhu and he hears about the glories of Nityananda Prabhu. But now, when he sees Nityananda Prabhu from far away, there's a big crowd, so many Vaishnavas are just surrounding Nityananda Prabhu, and Nityananda Prabhu is sitting on a, on a stone slab on an asana. And his body is so radiant and he looks so glorious that Raghunath Das Goswami was not even able to approach him. He was thinking, he was just mesmerized looking at him from so far away. And he thought, I have no qualification to go near your Nityananda Prabhu also. I better be far away. So glorious and there's some amazing devotees, great devotees are surrounding him. Very senior people. Who am I? I am nothing. I'm like a worm. I'm a cockroach. I better just stay far away. So he was just staying far away and he was looking from far. He was having darshan of, of Nityananda Prabhu. And Nityananda Prabhu from far away, nothing is hidden from him. He was able to see Raghunath Das Goswami standing in a corner behind the tree. And suddenly he shouted, Thief! Thief! Catch him! Catch that thief! Right? And everybody was thinking, oh, thief? What? But, you know, what is there? Why? Which thief? Everybody turned and Raghunath Das Goswami was standing. He was feeling embarrassed that, see, he's talking about me. And, you know, so Nityananda Prabhu said, yes, that's him. That's a thief. Go catch him. Everybody was thinking, Are, he looks like a simple guy, but Nityananda Prabhu is telling he's a thief. Then all the other senior Vaishnavas understood the heart of Nityananda Prabhu. So they, everybody said, no, don't touch him. We will go. So all the senior Vaishnavas went and they caught him. And they bought him. Very politely but sweetly they bought him. They said, you thief, come, let's meet Nityananda Prabhu. So Nityananda Prabhu met him. They, uh, Nityananda Prabhu very strictly looked at him and he said, you are a thief, you are a big thief. So he said, what did I steal? I did not steal anything. He said, you, you stole my property, something that belongs to me. You are trying to steal it. He said, well, what is, I don't know what, what, is, what belongs to you and what did I steal? He said, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu belongs to me and you tried to meet him twice without my permission. That's why you're a thief. So he, he said, I'm really, very sorry. And he fell at the lotus feet of Nityananda Prabhu. Nityananda Prabhu does things that nobody else does. And he took his lotus feet and he kept it on his head. 
head of Raghunath Das Goswami. And he gave him his blessings that way. And then, this connects with a very important lesson. You see, Balaram or Nityananda Prabhu, they are considered as Adi Guru. And without a Guru, one must not approach Krishna. And this lesson is taught even in Ramayana. In Ramayana also, when Lord Ramachandra and Lakshmana, they meet Sugriva for the first time. Sugriva, he meets Ramachandra. He says, oh, Ragukula Nandana, so nice to see you. And he embraces him and he says, you know, uh, so what brings you here and all of that. And uh, he gives him, uh, he says, you know, my wife, uh, Sita Devi, she has been kidnapped. And even while telling that, uh, he cries. Ramachandra has tears in his eyes. And Sugriva looks at him and he says, uh, hey, what is all this? Huh? Crying for wife and all that. What a Kshatriya, look at you. You should, not, uh, you should not cry for such things. This is all nonsense. Huh? This is all sign of weakness, he said. So Ramachandra said, okay. Why are you here in this, in this mountain region? So he said, uh, my brother kicked me out. He took away my wife. And he started crying and he started rolling on the ground. So, <laughs> Valmiki, he explains at that point that when a person gives advice to others, they act like they are Vyasa and Parashara. But when it comes to applying the same principles for themselves, they forget, forget all of that, right? So, the one thing that we get for free, advice, correct? Anybody will give us advice. They may not know anything about the situation. All our relatives, anyone you meet, they will all give us advice. But they will never apply it in their personal lives. That's why advice should be taken from a person who is personally applying it. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, prachara should happen only by a person who does achara. A person who is applying it in their personal life, only they should speak. A person who is smoking cigarettes cannot come and tell you not to smoke cigarettes. Correct? So only a person who is applying certain principles can come and talk about those certain principles. So achara, prachara, both should be done. So in this regard, in that same cave, uh, he makes uh, friends with uh, Ramachandra and he says, uh, don't worry, I have an army also. Uh, wherever Sita Devi is, we will find her. And you have my full support. The coalition government, we all know, recent time, a lot of things have happened. So coalition government at that time. So Ramachandra said, okay, fine, now I'll take your help. But he says, if you need my help, you have to help me also. I cannot kill Wali. Can you kill Wali? Ramachandra said, I've killed many people. Wali is nothing. I can kill him. Don't worry. So how do we do it? You go and fight with him and uh, I will shoot him down with my arrow. So all of you know this person. So he goes, they fight together and uh, Ramachandra does not shoot the arrow. And Wali beats uh, Sugriva like anything. Beats him up like anything. Black and blue. He is no match to Wali's strength. And Sugriva comes running with all sprain and cramps and everything. And so, why didn't you, why didn't you uh, do this? Why didn't you help me? Ramachandra says, I could not recognize you at all. You and Wali look the same. He says, yeah, we are twins, but you know, you kind of have different clothes. You could have recognized. He says, no, I could not recognize you at all. Actually, it was quite simple to recognize. Everybody else could recognize, even though they were twins. But Ramachandra refused to recognize. So he says, there is only one way. You will have to wear a garland. And this garland, Lakshmana will have to put this garland on you. And if you need this garland from Lakshmana, you will have to request Lakshmana to give you that garland. So he gave special attention to Lakshmana. So what had happened here was that Sugriva, when he invited Ramachandra, he actually ignored Lakshmana. He did not give any attention to Lakshmana. He thought, what is he? Rama is the king. Let me focus on Rama. So he didn't even offer him a seat, Lakshmana. He told him, yeah, you stand there. And uh, yes, Rama. So he was talking directly to Rama. Ramachandra observed that. And he said, you need to learn this, but you'll learn this through a punishment. So let me get you beaten up first. Right? So anybody who's approaching Ramachandra, Lakshmana is playing the role of Adi Guru. It's the same Ananta. Lakshmana, Balarama, Nityananda Prabhu. They're all the same. Okay, so they are Adi Guru. So without a Guru, one must not approach Krishna. So this is what Ramachandra also thought. So after he got the blessings of Lakshmana through that garland, Ramachandra is saying, you and all, all other living entities in that world, everybody looks the same to me. I have no distinction. 
Krishna tells in the Bhagavad Gita that I'm not partial to any living entities. Everybody is the same to me. But he gives special attention to his devotees. And who are his devotees? One who is recognized by his devotee. So now that Lakshma, uh, Sugriva has been recognized by his devotee, Lakshmana, now he says, you've been recognized and you've been, you have a stamp from my devotee. Now I will protect you. Right? So Nityananda Prabhu wanted to teach him the same thing. And he said, you cannot approach Chaitanya Mahaprabhu without me. He is mine. So you'll have to go through me. So and he so he did not say it in so many words, but he said it in his own in his own style that you're a thief. You try to approach him. That is why he never got permission to surrender completely to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was always half baked, he was always sent back home. So his desire was not fulfilled entirely. So our um, uh, Raghunadas Goswami, he asked, what can I do as a Prayashchita? He says, yes, Prayashchita is important. Punishment is important. So you do one thing. I want you to prepare food, a big feast, for all the devotees present here. And there were many, many thousands of devotees who were present. He said, I want you to prepare a feast. So he says, okay, I, I can do it. I can do it. I, he was rich. He had the money to do it. He was carrying gold coins and all that. I have the money. I can do it. But uh, you know, so quickly, where can I cook? What, what can I do? Nityananda Prabhu said, don't worry about all those things. Very simple items. He said, take uh, flat rice. How lucky? Flat rice. So take flat rice, take curd, mix it, add uh, sugar. Uh, sugar is not the sugar that we get these days. This sugar these days is not good. Uh, when uh, even in our Ayurveda or our Shastras, whenever it mentions sugar, it, may, it speaks about Kalsakre or Mishri. In Hindi, Hindi, they call it Mishri or Kannada, they say Kalsakre. That is the actual sugar. And that is very sattvic by nature. That is alkaline. This one is, uh, this white sugar is poisonous. It is very uh, acidic in nature. It is not good for health at all. But if you want, if you replace it, you can replace it with some very nice things like um, jaggery is there, but um, you know, this um, mishri or kalsakre is very good also. Okay, So that is very sattvic in nature. So I said you can mix that and you add fruits um, like uh, mangoes, etc. So he said, very well, we'll do it. So he mixed, he got all these things and he, there were many shopkeepers who got to know that the big piece is going to come. Even from the neighboring villages, all these shopkeepers came with all their uh, you know, flat rice and fruits and all of that. And uh, uh, Raghunadas uh, Goswami bought everything from everybody and big vessels, they mixed everything and they started feeding devotees. And everybody was having so much of flat rice. And so this special dish is called as Chida and Dahi. Chida means flat rice, Dahi is yogurt. So it's called Chida Dahi. So there is an entire celebration, a festival called Chida Dahi Mahotsava that is celebrated even today which is going to happen this month on the on the 23rd. So even we celebrate Chida Dahi, very special day when we celebrate this and Chida Dahi is made and it is put in pots and we offer it to the, the Lord. All of you can also make, it's a very simple dish, you don't have to go to YouTube and check and all that, very simple dish any of our devotees will explain. Just add uh, soak it in maybe milk or something. You can add some uh, yogurt to it. Add fruits, cut fruits like uh, mangoes. Some people add banana, strawberry, whatever flavor you want. You can add all of that. Uh, uh, some people add honey to add the sweet. Some people add, uh, you know, Kalsa uh, Krem, Shri, etc. So you can do all of that. And this is offered. So this is also celebrated on the 23rd. And all of you are uh, more than welcome to join us on the celebration. I think Prabhu will tell you more about that. So, this happened and this, uh, you know, festival was very grand, very big and everybody enjoyed it so much that there were so many devotees that the land was completely covered. There was no place to stand. So, the devotees would even enter the Ganga River. They were halfway inside Ganga River and they were standing inside Ganga River in India because there was no place to stand on the land. There were that many number of devotees. So everybody was fed very nicely. So after this big feast, there was, and this Chida Dahi was served by Nityananda Prabhu to all the devotees. Raghunathas Goswami was also serving it. But there was one more person who was serving it, who nobody else could see. But only Nityananda Prabhu 
and Raghunath Das Goswami could see this one person. And this was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is very far away in Jagannath Puri. But because of this feast, he also manifested over there, invisible to everybody else. But only these two personalities were able to see. So they all serve Vaishnavas. Actually, serving Vaishnavas is a wonderful way to please Krishna. Because when you serve Vaishnavas through uh, Prasadam, and there is a way to serve also. So that's also a certain etiquette. So when we serve happily to everybody, and once they consume, then Guru becomes happy. That is Nityananda Prabhu. And when Guru is happy, then automatically Krishna is also happy. That is the process. We don't approach Krishna directly. So, through this particular process, uh, everybody was happy, but there was one more devotee. His name was Radhava Pandita. Raghava Pandita was another devotee. Nityananda Prabhu had earlier told him, hey, uh, cook a big feast and we are going to come to your house. Raghava Pandita was also a very great devotee. It is said that whenever he would cook, Srimati Radharani herself would appear in the kitchen and taste the food. And she would approve it before he offers it to Krishna. Even Radharani wanted to eat what he had cooked. He was such a wonderful cook. Nobody could cook like him. So, Srimati Radharani herself would come, dip her finger into the food, taste it, and she would say, Krishna, I like this. Or if some changes are required, she would say, add little pepper, add little this, add little that. Imagine getting guidance from Radharani. This can happen. So, um, so in this way, uh, Raghava Pandita would... So, Raghava Pandita had also prepared a piece. He said, he told Nithyananda Prabhu, you told me to cook. No, all this is going to go. He said, now what am I going to do? Nithyananda Prabhu said, don't worry, don't worry. It's only afternoon. We'll come back in the night. And in the night, we'll eat again. So, um, they went, when I say night, it is evening, actually. So, by sunset, before sunset, they approached there to Raghav Pandit's house and they consumed. So, which means that dinner needs to be eaten before sunset. Right, Prabhu? Is that okay? Uh, Prabhu will approve. Okay. <laughs> Should not be eaten after sunset. So, before sunset, uh, Nityananda Prabhu set a proper standard that dinner should be eaten, but they had a very heavy, nice dinner at that particular point. And all that dinner, and, uh, you know, Raghav Pandita was thinking that, you know, so much of food is there, it may go wasted. But Nityananda Prabhu was eating, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was eating. In fact, they ate the food of nearly 100 people each. And they had become unstoppable. So much that now Raghav Pandita was thinking, the food may be less. Should I cook again? What am I supposed to do? So, uh, they were sometimes, uh, the Lord likes to tease their devotees in that way. So, he said, no, all your food is over. Okay, we are also happy. So, he let them be. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also was there. And, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not seen to anybody. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again was seen only to Raghunath Das uh, And Nityananda Prabhu, of course. Now, Nityananda Prabhu said, now you will get the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Now that I have introduced you to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you can approach him. So, then he... Ultimately, it's a long story of how this entire thing happened. But uh, he travels. It was a long journey. It was a 15-day journey to Jagannath Puri. He goes walking because his father, along with some soldiers, were looking for him in the forest. So he took a very tedious journey. It was a very tedious, difficult journey, climbing mountains, etc. And finally, he reached uh, Jagannath Puri. And he met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu there. And this is Nityananda Prabhu performing Kirtana. And when he met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Raghunath Das Goswami fell at his lotus feet and told him, this time I am not going back. If you tell me to go back, I will just die. I will die. So, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, okay, fine. You can continue to be my uh, be with me. But, uh, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu initiated him. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu became his guru. But he said, you need a shiksha guru. You need to learn. So, he hands him over to another Great devotee, Sarvabhauma Bhattacharya. So he says, from today, you belong to Sarvabhauma. So Sarvabhauma is another great Acharya. So he says, you are uh, going to be his disciple and you will learn from him. So he started learning many things from him. But he had, you see, he had traveled for 15 days and he had hardly eaten. He had had only three meals. In 15 days, he had eaten only three times. Uh, Raghunath Goswami in his journey to Jagannath. So he was completely his fatigued, his body had become very weak. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and still he never thought of food. He thought of how I can serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Mahaprabhu said, you have become very thin. So he told Sarvabhauma, 
you first feed him, take care of him. So Sarvabhama Bhattacharya used to feed him in Jagannath Puri. After the Lord eats, a big meal used to come for Raghunath Das. So he used to eat and he enjoyed the first day, then he ate the second day, then the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day. Then for a week he ate every day a large meal that would come from Jagannath, from Jagannath Mandir. Anybody has been here to Jagannath Temple? Okay, very good. So everybody should go. That is another special place. Only Priya Prabhu will take you. <laughs> okay. So Jagannath Puri. So he went there. And uh, after one week, Raghunath Das Goswami said, what kind of a person am I? What kind of a disciple am I? My guru, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, every day is bringing food for me and I'm nicely sitting and eating. Is this a duty of a disciple that my guru has to come and serve me? Have I come to serve my guru or has my guru come to serve me? What am I doing? I'm such a, my, my brain is just filled with food. I'm only thinking about eating food. This is wrong. And from that day, he decided that he will not eat. How to not eat? He said, I will not eat. So every time Sarva Bhavam Bhattacharya would bring, he would go missing. He was not even there. Now, where would he go and eat? They would, the pujari sometimes from the altar, they would give uh, you know, a free, some prasad, a small amount of prasad they would give. So he would go and he would collect it from there. He managed for a few days like that. Then he felt, what is this? You know, I'm just waiting when the pujari will come. When I will get food from him? Is this what a disciple is supposed to do? Have I come to Jagannath Puri for this? I should not do this. So he said, henceforth, I will not even do that. If someone comes and gives me something, I may eat. Then he said, sometimes somebody would give, sometimes they would not give. So a little bit, he would eat. Then he said, this also should not be done because I'm always thinking, well, I should make my own arrangement. So he made his own arrangement that the wasted food, the food that was spoiled in Jagannath Puri, that was thrown away outside in the outskirts. Extra rice or this and that. It was rotten. It was thrown. It was so bad that even the cows would not eat it. He would go and he would collect the rice from there. He would wash it in some water and he would have a handful of that. And that's all he would eat. And he did not do this to get anybody's attention. That all of you look at me, I'm so renounced. He did this very quietly. Nobody even knew about this. But someone looked at this. Someone saw and they informed Sarva Bahama. And Sarva Mohan Bhattacharya informed Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is actually very happy. Uh, he said externally that, no, 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 he should eat and all of that. But internally, he was very happy to know that he is truly living the life of a disciple. Because, you see, Raghunath Das Goswami was actually the energy of renunciation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's renunciation had appeared as Raghunath Das Goswami, teaching us what true renunciation really is. And he led his life in this way. Many things happened in between, but he continued to serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for nearly 16 years after this. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his pastimes on this planet was over by then. And at the age of 48, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu decided that he has to go back. So he wound up his pastimes and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, one day in the middle of a kirtan, he just disappeared. There is a temple called Tota Gopinath. Even today, if you go to Tota Gopinath, there is a small crack in the chest of the Vigraha, the deity. It is said that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in between the Kirtan, while dancing, he just jumped and he entered into the body of Tota Gopinath. And that way, he just disappeared like that. So he did not have some like some ordinary people die or something. Like that. So he just suddenly disappeared and Raghunath Das Goswami was heartbroken. And after some time, even his guru, Sarva Bhama Bhattacharya, also died. Then he thought, what is the meaning of my life? It's better that I commit suicide. And he, he just thought, I have no meaning to my life. But then uh, he was given, uh, you know, there were other Acharyas, other Goswamis, 